Good morning and good afternoon to all of you that have logged on. My name is Suda David Wilp, and on behalf of the German Marshall Fund, I'd like to welcome you to our election event. This election event is going to hone in on two battleground states that will have an important impact on the race to the White House, as well as on the balance of power in Congress. And those states are Arizona and Wisconsin. Uh, before I introduce our speakers today, I'd like to also thank the um, US Mission to EU for support of today's discussion. And as I mentioned, we're really excited to have two expert speakers with us today. Um, Charles Coughlin and Eleanor Powell will take a deep dive into the states that they're based in, talk about polling, and also about the issues that are driving voters in those two states. Let me quickly introduce our speakers, and I encourage all of you to send questions on the Q&A um, function, the chat, that there's an icon at the bottom of your screen. The questions will automatically queue up, and if you can identify yourself so I can also give a shout out to everybody that is um, asking a question. So um, Chuck is CEO and president of High, High Ground Incorporated. He founded the company 25 years ago um, as a political consulting firm specializing in campaign management. Uh, Chuck has been declared best political operative five times by the Arizona Capital Times. He served as um, Governor Brewer's transition chairman in 2009 and was also um, a campaign manager for Co Governor Simington's 1994 re-election campaign in Arizona. Um, Ellie is the Booth Fowler Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Previously, previously to this uh, position, she was an assistant professor for political science at Yale University. Her focus is on Congress and she focuses on three specific topics the influence of money in American politics, understanding political parties, and exploring the com complexities of Congress, which is definitely a difficult thing to do these days. So I guess I'll start off um, with a general question to both of you, and um, maybe we can go to Chuck first and then go to Ellie and we can switch it off as we go on um, with our conversation. So what is the current state of polling right now in your two states? Where do things stand? Can you unmute yourself, uh, Chuck and Ellie? There we go. Oh, not yet, Chuck. You have to unmute yourself. Mute. There we go. <laughs> OK. Uh, technology, we're trying to keep up with everything these days. It's a little earlier here in Arizona, too. So, um, so um, in the current state of affairs, the president, vice president appears to have anywhere from a three to five point lead in Arizona right now. Um, but as we all say, you know, polls, uh, most the only poll that counts is on election day. Uh, but that's been pretty consistent. Uh, our firm did some polling in early October. It had the president down one. So it was within the margin of error and it's still pretty close. Uh, but you know, the, the, it appears right now that the uh, vice president Biden has a small lead here in Arizona. How do things look in Wisconsin, Ellie? Yeah, we're seeing a fairly similar uh, picture with you know, Vice President Biden having a somewhat larger lead than he does in Arizona, depending on the polls that you look at, anywhere between you know three to nine points. Uh, we just con conducted a poll here at the University of Wisconsin that we just released this morning that had Biden, uh, Vice President Biden up nine points in Wisconsin, which is a pretty big gain over the last poll that we ran in September, where he was only up five points. So close-ish, but, but maybe not as close as we saw earlier in the race. So if we can rewind, how does the polling compare to how things looked at the beginning of 2020 <laughs> before this crisis year unfolded? I mean, what did it look like in Arizona and Wisconsin compared to now? Arizona is a traditionally Republican state. We know that the last president to win Arizona, um, a Democrat, the last president to win Arizona was Bill Clinton in 96. Um, we had some Democrats win in the 18 cycle out here on a statewide ballot. Um, that was the first time that's happened since 2008. So it would have been a pretty Republican state. So I like to, I like to tell people, absent the pandemic, um, Arizona would would have voted for for the president um, if the if the economy would have maintained 
uh, where it was and things all stayed the same as a midterm referendum election without the uh, tragedy of the pandemic and the economic collapse, I'm pretty confident that the state would have voted for President Trump. Ellie, and what about Wisconsin? I mean, Wisconsin did a flip in 2016. Um, do you think it would have stayed in, under the Republican column if not for the, I mean, we still don't know what's gonna happen, but the, the spread is quite large, what you just described. Yeah, I, I think it would have been close. Uh, you know, President Trump barely won Wisconsin by about 20,000 votes in 2016. And the polls from earlier this year looked like they were very close. One of the things that's interesting that we've seen in our polling in Wisconsin is that the president's numbers have stayed the same. What's happened is Vice President Biden has picked up numbers, picked up support from undecided voters and from voters who were leaning towards voting for a third party candidate. So President Trump hasn't lost support. It's just the undecided folks and those third party folks have been all shifting over to Vice President Biden. And maybe Ellie, you can talk a little bit about, I mean, what is the voter composition in Wisconsin? I mean, we talk about, you know, the soccer moms or the hockey moms and what was it, um, Joe the plumber? Is that, <laughs> wasn't that somebody a few years ago? So what, what are those significant voting groups in Wisconsin right now? Well, Wisconsin's uh, an overwhelmingly white state and it's pretty different across the state. So I'm in Madison, a sort of liberal college town where, you know, which will unquestionably overwhelmingly vote for Vice President Biden. There's a sort of more urban center of Milwaukee, which does have a larger number of voters of color and will certainly go towards uh, Vice President Biden as well. But throughout the state, there are many, many um, conservative rural areas of the state that will be strong bastions of support for, pre for President Trump, sort of regardless of any other concerns. There are swing areas, areas like Green Bay that tend to be sort of bellwether indicators that, you know, sort of just went for um, President Trump in 2016 and previously had supported uh, President Obama. So those are sort of areas we're paying attention to, looking at you know, particularly a lot of um, white non-college voters who were sort of some of the core constituencies for President Trump in 2016. So Ellie, let me just stay with you for one more moment and then we'll go back to Chuck, just because you brought up sort of the um, geographical differences within the state of Wisconsin. And I read two articles just recently um, in the New Yorker about, I, I don't know if this is correct, sort of the wow counties in Wisconsin. And also um, there's an article in the post, I think it was put up yesterday about how Wisconsin is a little bit like a microcosm of the United States when it comes to the issues that our country is facing, the rural urban divides, the pandemic, um, you know, racial is issues. Can you talk us through a little bit about what, you know, what those issues are in your state or just go a little deeper? Sure. Yeah. So um, you mentioned the, the, the wow counties. There are these uh, suburban counties outside of Milwaukee. Uh, these are areas that tend to be sort of strong Republican supporting areas. Um, they're sort of more, I guess I would say traditional Republican areas, um, sort of higher levels of education than we see in some other parts of the state. And those, again, traditionally very strongly supportive of Republican candidates, but it looks like President Trump's support is a little weaker there than we've seen in uh, past cycles. You know, Wisconsin has had really big urban-rural differences, really big divides along education. One of the reasons why polls were so off in Wisconsin in particular in 2016 is because pollsters weren't controlling for education. And 2016 was one of the really unusual years where we saw um, big education divides in terms of which candidates were being supported. And so those are sort of big flashpoints uh, to pay attention to within the state. And then you, know, you also mentioned racial justice. Uh, the city of Kenosha in Wisconsin is one of the areas that's had sort of big protests um, uh, surrounding policing issues. And so that's also had been, received a lot of attention throughout the state and, and nationally, such that you know, racial justice is certainly uh, on the radar for some folks. Although when you ask voters in Wisconsin, what are the most important issues to them? You know, that doesn't register as one of the top issues. We see Democrats talking about the pandemic followed by healthcare versus Republicans are concerned about the economy uh, and the virus. And so we just don't see that registering as the top concern in this time of so many crises uh, happening. 
Um, Chuck, I mean, since you've been dealing with polls for, for decades now, I mean, what Ellie just said, do you think the pollsters have learned from 2016? Has there been an adjustment to get at sort of a, I mean, they're all, they're, they're just a snapshot in time, but have they been bet, have they been tinkered with to get a better assessment of um, the voting pool out there? Well, if I may, I'll go, because the question actually involves the same question you just asked her. It's about a model. And the model in Arizona, Arizona has like three distinct geographic communities when we talk about voting. We have Maricopa County, which is the largest county in, in the country uh, that encompasses Phoenix and all the surrounding suburbs around Phoenix. About 60% or more of the state's voting population lives in Maricopa County. So it is the, the whale that sort of dictates everything else that happens. And then you have uh, Pima County where the uh, University of Arizona and Tucson is. That's about 18% of the electorate and then greater Arizona. And what, uh, which is roughly 22 to 25 percent of the electorate on turnout, um, the the Maricopa County is the county that's changing, um, that has been changing due to affluence, um, uh, additional jobs, migration. Arizona has always been an enormous in migration state from places like Wisconsin in the mid when people want to retire. Lots of uh, retirees, lots of military veterans because of the presence of military bases here in the state. Um, and then, uh, and so what generally happens with polls is national pollsters tend to oversample Maricopa County um, because of the large uh, number of people that participate here. And it's harder and you gotta balance those uh, constituencies out. And so what we've seen, uh, again, in, in greater Arizona, the president is winning, you know, three to one, maybe four to one in those greater communities as, as Ellie was describing. And, outside of the urban areas, um, but uh, with, the, and, and Tucson um, is, uh, and Pima County is uh, a, a much more liberal part of the state with the university being, uh, one of the universities being down there. I always call it Mexico's most Northern community <laughs> because it sort of acts that way. And that's another thing that's important to point out. We don't have a, a big um, uh, uh, African American population here in Arizona. It's a very, it's relatively small, but we do have a, a very large Hispanic population. Um, Mexico is the state's largest trading partner. Um, we have an active large border, which probably many people have heard about that at times has been uh, 10 years ago would have been the source of a lot of anxiety with Mexican drug cartels and trade. Uh, and uh, human smuggling uh, from all the way into from Central America up here. That has not ha been as a prevalent of an issue anymore because the administration and the previous administration got a lot more control of the border, operational control. But trade is still really important. And we still yet to get a resolution out of Congress on an immigration uh, package that would really benefit the state, immigration and border security. So there is a very active, back into your social justice issue, um, a very active Hispanic population and a, a group uh, and a significant number of uh, African Americans uh, that, have, that have activated principally within Maricopa County here and led to um, significant discussions about uh, justice reform. I think many people are probably all across the world uh, know our state's famous sheriff, uh, Arpaio, mm -hmm. Um, who was defeated uh, in, in uh, four years ago by a Democrat, which was the first time that, that something like that happened here in Maricopa County. Um, and so we, we, we see change happening in the state's largest county. And as I mentioned before, we see some of that being reflected in the statewide ballot with, say, Kirsten Sinema being elected to a statewide Senate office and then three other officers being elected to statewide office. In this cycle, we also have a very competitive Senate race with uh, Mark Kelly, uh, astronaut, fighter pilot, Gabby Gifford's husband uh, against Martha McSally, who lost last time. I don't think I wanna go into the details of how that happened, uh, but uh, she's running again. This is the end of Senator McCain's uh, uh, seat, um, which will be up again in two years. And all polling indicates that um, uh, Mark Kelly is significantly ahead in that race. 
So that so would I be the first. Actually, interject yeah, that, on that, um, yeah. Chuck. I mean that because that's another question I had. I mean, and um, it sounds like Arizona is getting prepared to have uh, two Democratic senators come next year. I mean, this is the state of Barry Goldwater. Have, did you ever think that, I mean, you've been in the business for so long that your state would have two Democratic senators in Congress? Well, I mean, and- It hasn't happened yet, but it, like you said- it, It's like it, 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 everybody, way. yeah, the, the money's on that happening. Uh, that will be the first time since 1952 that the state will have two Democratic senators. Um, and that was Barry Goldwater's first term, the, the, the beginning of what you would call the Republican era of, in, uh, uh, in Arizona, um, the birth of that. And so a lot of people are, are, are commenting on that very issue. So where, where does the party go from here? Uh, I think that's a fascinating discussion uh, as it relates to Arizona because Mark Kelly will be up again in two years. And so we have an immediate referendum on um, what that what that means. I, I take it more uh, in Arizona as a uh, rejection of current governing policy politics of the Republican Party. People will remember that John McCain represented the state for a long time. Certainly, his politics is different than the than the president's politics right now. We had Jeff Flake, who was pretty much drummed out of the party who was a free trade uh, guy who was uh, drummed out of the party, uh, losing his seat. He didn't even run. He, he walked away from it. And so, uh, the, the, but if Trump is to fail out here, you would say that the narrative that the Republican Party is running on is not being successful. It is incapable of being successful in Arizona. And so then it becomes, what does that become? What does what what is that narrative? Who's going to lead that narrative? And so, you know, to me, that's a pretty exciting opportunity to redefine what that means. And simultaneously, I think voters and, and the public should pay attention to what the Democratic Party is doing, because I've said a number of times that, um, let's say, Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer couldn't get elected in Arizona. Um, that that type of, you know, people say, is Arizona turning uh, blue? Um, I say not that shade of blue. <laughs> it, it's a different shade of blue, uh, and Kirsten Cinema and Mark Kelly can potentially be leading voices in defining what that different shade of blue is. So I think the state's going to be continuing an inter interested place to watch for those very dynamics. So you teed me up for a perfect question for Ellie. Actually, um, you know how do I mean? So what what do the you know, the loyal voters for Trump in Wisconsin thing, what, what are the messages there? Because it seems like, is it law and order? It seems like there's not a lot of traction in Arizona right now, but what are the issues that are still getting him votes in Wisconsin? And um, what Chuck just talked about, the shade of blue, is Joe Biden um, easier for Democrats in the Midwest, like in Wisconsin, than Hillary Clinton in 2016. What, what are the differences that voters see that they may go go back to Biden? Is it just anti-Trump or is it because they see um, Joe Biden standing up for their interests? Yeah, so I mean, Wisconsin's an interesting state. We're, we have less of a sort of, I guess, like centrist voting group than I would say we do in Arizona. We have sort of a lot of liberal voters and we have a lot of conservative voters and we don't have a lot of people in between. So if you look at our Senate delegation, we have one of the most liberal senators and Tammy Baldwin and we have one of the most conservative senators, big uh, President Trump supporter Ron Johnson as our other senator. And so we have this sort of, not schizophrenic exactly, but just really divided politics. And so it's, it's difficult to, I think, to actually sort of chart a course for politicians to sort of find a successful path that seems to be consistently working in Wisconsin. You know, you asked about sort of what's motivating President Trump's uh, supporters. You know, we've seen some interesting variation over the course of the campaign. Um, we've been doing a panel survey where we talked to the same voters several times throughout the year. And we saw in September among President Trump supporters, crime pop up as one of the most important issues. That was during the sort of race riots in Kenosha, followed which there was a lot of um, looting and sort of property destruction in both Kenosha and Madison, Milwaukee, some of the other areas of the state. And that co coincided with this big increase in concern about crime among the president's supporters. 
but we've seen that drop off. Whereas again, in October, it barely registered as, as one of the top issues. What we're seeing politically in the state is a lot of political contestation surrounding the pandemic. So we have a democratic governor right now who's tried to put in place various um, restrictions with regard to the massive outbreak we have in Wisconsin right now. We have one of the worst outbreaks uh, in the world. And um, the governor's tried to put in place mass restrictions, crowd gathering restrictions, and we've seen the Republicans uh, and the legislature sue in the courts to get those orders uh, knocked down. And so there's been sort of this big difference of opinion about the sort of approach to the pandemic with Republicans in the state much more concerned about the impact of those restrictions on the economy, whereas Democratic voters and politicians seem more concerned about sort of tamping down the virus in order to sort of help help the economy sort of flow that flow that way. And so again, these sort of big differences of opinion about sort of strategy for, for how to proceed with regard to, to the pandemic. And what about the question about Joe Biden? Um, do voters, are, are, is he, does, do they see him in a different light than they saw perhaps Hillary Clinton in 2016? Yeah, he has a, just a much more, um, he's viewed much more favorably. He has much lower negatives than, you know, um, Secretary Clinton sort of had so many years of being the sort of uh, bad guy or sort of criticized throughout in American politics by Republicans such that you know, when she was running, her negatives were so high in Wisconsin and around the country that it was sort of, you know, she had a pretty low ceiling in terms of people she could possibly support. You know, Vice President Biden, even though he's been a fixture in American politics for decades, is much less known and he just doesn't have the sort of hatred and vitriol associated with him that we saw with Secretary Clinton. And sort of his background of sort of, you know, the, the like white working class Scranton Joe certainly has a, a, a resonance uh, in Wisconsin, or at least it's been proven much more difficult to demonize him successfully that we saw that was so successful with Secretary Clinton. Okay, so it looks like there are questions um, now in the chat or in the Q&A um, box. So I'm gonna go first to former member of Congress, Jim Colby from the great state of Arizona. Um, I guess this question will go to Chuck first. Uh, how is the surge in early voting in both states going to affect the final outcome? Will we see um, you know, perhaps a lead for Trump on election night, but then later return surging to put Biden in the lead like happened with the Cinema McSally race in 2018. So Chuck, why don't you take that? Well, that's a very interesting question. <clears throat> we have unprecedented returns right now. So let's start with the history of early voting in Arizona. We have a deep history of early voting in Arizona going back to the mid nineties. Um, and so 85% of the electorate in Arizona routinely votes by mail. Um, and that was a program that was started by Republicans out here to get older voters to participate and snowbirds, people who visit and vacation in Arizona. Um, historically, it's been Republicans who have dominated that uh, realm and have always consistently had a lead going into election night with Republican votes uh, dominating. That is not the case this time. Uh, we have, uh, we've been doing some analysis Already uh, over a third of the electorate, we anticipate about 3 million voters voting in this cycle. Already 1.2 million people have voted uh, already. And the demography of that group is very interesting. Um, as of last Friday, uh, Democrats were outperforming re Republicans uh, by eight percentage points and, and, Democrat and Republicans were underperforming what their total number was in the past by about nine. And then the uh, independent portion of the electorate, uh, unaffiliated, which like Wisconsin is about a third of the electorate out here, um, uh, they have been outperforming them their own number by a, quite a like three or four points. But the interesting thing that we saw in the primary was that those independent voters, because <clears throat> they can participate in Arizona's primary by requesting a ballot. Um, they were requesting ballots uh, of the Democratic Party at about a 58-42 percentage. So it appears, A, that there's a, uh, a, a tremendous amount more Democratic enthusiasm and that independent voters are breaking uh, towards the Democratic Party. Um, having said all that, I still think there, those Republican ballots will show up. But the weird part about this cycle is that the president's narrative about not trusting the postal service and those things 
I believe has had a direct impact on those voters turning in their ballots historically at the rate they have been. And so what we're looking for is how do they catch up and do they catch up and do they drop them off on election night, which is going to be another problem because Arizona, given its history, we will we will have all of those absentee ballots that are in um, uh, before election day um, counted by eight o'clock on election night. So if your folks want to stay up really late and see those results, they can see them at eight o'clock Pacific time on election night. But those those votes that get turned in at the polls, you know, dropped off in a basket will not be counted that night because you have to do signature verification on them. So uh, I, that was now historically it's Democrats who lead late turnout, as we saw in the last cycle in 18. You saw um, we went to bed and Senator McSally was up by a point um, going into a, going into the next that close of the election night. The next morning, and I presume I predicted this that cinema would win because those late ballots traditionally it doesn't seem like anything's traditional about 2020. But it, traditionally, those late ballots have been Democrats. And um, Ellie, what about Wisconsin? Um, what are what's early is the early voting happening or mail in ballots? And what do you anticipate in terms of? this split are, I mean, actually we were saying, I mean, it might actually hurt Republicans that want to vote on election day because of the, um, the intensity of the pandemic right now in Wisconsin. Yeah, so Wisconsin doesn't nearly have the same history of vote by mail or early voting that Arizona does. It's a pretty unusual thing here historically. Obviously that's changing uh, this year. So we're seeing huge numbers of um, vote by mail and early voting and really big partisan splits in the folks who are voting by mail. Wisconsin doesn't have party registration, so we can't talk about whose request uh, did vote by mail by party and sort of who's returned their ballot by party. But uh, in our survey, we asked people sort of how they intended to vote and whether they had already intended to vote. And for the po folks who had already voted up to this point, we saw Biden winning with about a 40 percentage point margin among those who had already voted, which is just wild in Wisconsin. We're not obviously not going to see that margin. Among those who are planning to vote on election day, President Trump has about a 20 point uh, margin, right? So it's just a, a tremendous partisan split in the sort of early vote intention versus the uh, election day vote intention. Now, how that shakes out with this virus raging throughout the state is creating a lot of uncertainty. One of the things, we were one of the strange states that had our spring primary so late, it was actually while the pandemic was raging. And what we saw then is we had tremendous shortages of poll workers throughout the state, particularly in urban areas. So a city like Milwaukee, which is a tremendously large city for the state, it's the largest city in the state, only had five polling stations open for the entire state. There were massive lines. There was tremendous confusion because polling places were closing at the last minute. There have been major efforts throughout the state to change that and recruit polling workers. So cities like Madison, cities like Milwaukee have had a surplus of volunteers. They've been turning people away for weeks because they have so many people volunteering to help. It's actually now rural areas that are having a shortage of poll workers. And as of two weeks ago, the governor announced that we still didn't have enough poll workers in rural areas and he was going to activate the National Guard to help you know, fill those shortages. But this is where the uncertainty about how the virus is going to play out as you know people are getting sick throughout the state or needing to quarantine mm -hmm. or not wanting to show up in person because a lot of poll workers in Wisconsin like many places throughout the country tend to be sort of older retirees who are sort of more at risk with the virus it's just creating all of this additional uncertainty about sort of the president really needs those election day votes and so if people are sort of more hesitant to show up on election day that could create big problems for him now one silver lining that the president might look to is that, again, Wisconsin doesn't have this history of voting by mail, so people don't know how to do it very well. So in the spring, we saw about 2% of ballots rejected because they didn't have a signature match or some line of paperwork was missing or you know something wasn't filled out properly or missed the deadline for when it has to arrive. And so you know again, that could eat into Vice President Biden's margin. But if the margins are as big as they're looking like in some of the recent polls, even if he loses 2% of the vote by mail, 
shouldn't have a huge impact on the election and if if the polls turn out. But the sort of uncertainty surrounding the virus and the election day vote is, is creating a lot of uncertainty. Okay, I'm gonna take two questions and sort of consolidate them. One is from um, Rob Winder, who works for Arizona, the Arizona PBS affiliate, and uh, my colleague Corinna in Brussels. Um, Rob is asking about the role of religious voters and specifically uh, Mormon voters, for example, in Arizona. Biden has sort of made a, has done some outreach to this um, voting group. And how do, is this going to be significant in Arizona and other conservative voters that are maybe turned off from Trump? How are they, um, you know, what are they thinking about in terms of their vote? And also um, women, um, wh what are the issues that are driving women voters this year? That's what Corinna is asking. Um, are there are there issues that the uh, parties are specifically playing um, um, toward uh, women voters? Chuck, you want to go first? Sure, I'll take Corinna's question first. The thing that are driving women voters is the president, <laughs> so and his behavior, uh, and so that that is true, um, and there all the polling data shows that across the board that his behavior and you know, how do we say this politely, his, uh, his lack of empathy uh, and erratic, uh, erratic behavior as it relates to the public health pandemic has significantly damaged him where he was already having trouble before with those constituencies. Um, it is an, it, Rob asks a really interesting question. There is a significant uh, issue within the Mormon, uh, and Arizona has about a 13% Mormon population. Uh, with its proximity to Utah. We were some of the first uh, stakes that were formed outside of, um, of, uh, more of Utah. And so we have uh, Mesa, the um, second, um, third largest city in Arizona, about over a half a million people just east of Phoenix here, um, has a significant Mormon population um, and parts of Northeastern Arizona do as well. And he has struggled, begun to struggle more in the urban areas with those constituencies, again, based upon his, uh, his, the way he behaves uh, and um, the perception of his lack of moral clarity, if a uh, better word maybe, uh, and uh, uh, he struggled with those. He's also struggled uh, despite a national narrative that, that sort of pins the evangelical community with him. There's significant portions of the Protestant evangelical community that also uh, have struggled with the president as well. Um, you know, th there's a discussion there of, you know, where you're, where we put our idols in life, right? And so um, it, maybe politics has become an idol to a lot of people, not just us, uh, people in the, in the church, but also people outside the church. And so there's been a significant discussion, like Tim Keller uh, is a Manhattan pastor, uh, who's really intellectually bright, um, that uh, talks a lot about that and, and the church's role in social justice. And so um, there is a distinction within that community as well, despite the, the prevalence of the viewpoint that the evangelical community is strongly with the president. I don't believe that. Personally, I believe there's a significant portion of that electorate along with the Mormon community. We've had people former state senators, and there's groups of active Mormon women that have organized, uh, I can't think of the name right now, I re referred a couple of them to the Atlantic the other day, who have organized specific groups of Mormon women to oppose uh, the president. So there, there are challenges there. Um, that's not to say it's a majority of that community, I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize that, but historically where, they, where the president would have received you know, 90% of that community, that's not happening. Um, I think maybe 80%, 75%. And in any close election, those demography, those demographics become uh, it, very important. Um, Ellie, what about Wisconsin? Are um, you know, social, religious, conservative issues, um, do they move the needle in Wisconsin? And what are women thinking in Wisconsin? I know that, I mean, how, how do you, um, you know, it's obviously not a monolithic group, but what, you know, what are women voters thinking? Yeah, in, in Wisconsin, we're seeing women voters having the same uh, concerns that, that Chuck mentioned. There's a lot of concerns about President Trump and his behavior and a variety of issues. You know, when we ask women about their their most important issues, you know, we're seeing them talk about 
the pandemic, about healthcare, about the economy. I mean, the sort of same issues that we're seeing of concern uh, nationally are, are playing out here and are just being heightened by the, the state of the pandemic in Wisconsin. Okay, so now I have a question from um, Michaela Knuffler. She's actually got two questions, but um, you know, what's the feeling right now? I, I, I did read a statistic that a majority of Americans don't necessarily expect to have a clean result or a result on November 4th, that they realize that the results will take a while to tally up. But with President Trump calling into question sort of the, uh, the, the, um, the integrity of our system with all these mail-on ballots, how's that playing out in Arizona and Wisconsin? And especially in Wisconsin, because you have this situation, right, where you have a Democratic governor and a Republican state legislature. Do you anticipate um, issues after election night in your two states? Go ahead, Ellie, and then we'll go back to Chuck. Yeah, I think there could be some, some uh, contestation and uncertainty here in Wisconsin. Wisconsin uh, doesn't start counting absentee ballots until election day. And you know, those are gonna take a while to count and to tabulate. And you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're getting this big disconnect between the early vote and the election day vote such that you could have really different impressions based on the sort of election day count until you get all of those mail-in ballots counted. Everything in Wisconsin over the last two, three, five, six, seven years has been incredibly sort of polarized and hostile between the parties. And so, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a series of fireworks, whether they take the form of sort of lawsuits or other sorts of things sort of pushing back at the counts. I think it's going to depend a lot on what the margin looks like, how contentious that gets. I think if the margin looks close in terms of the vote, I, I wouldn't be surprised by a number of lawsuits in Wisconsin, again, pushing back at you know, trying to disqualify votes that might have arrived or any sort of any ground that anyone can find to sort of lodge a, a lawsuit, I wouldn't be surprised by. And we've seen a lot of pretty heated protests this year and, and earlier with sort of armed pre protesters showing up outside the Capitol to sort of, you know, express their views. And again, I wouldn't be surprised if things got pretty contentious here. But again, I think it depends on what the overall vote looks in the country and in the state. If you know it looks pretty clear on election day that you know Vice President Biden picks up Florida or one of the surprising swing states that counts votes faster, I think things might settle down and dissipate a little faster. If it looks contentious on election day, this could play out for a while and could get pretty ugly. Um, so we'll, we'll, I think we'll have to see. Chuck, what what do you what are people in Arizona thinking? Do they know? Do they think they're going to get a um, result right away, or are they? Um, sort of sitting tight for a couple of long weeks. I, I, I suspect that Arizona will not have a problem based on the history of voting here in Arizona um, and the confidence in the electoral system that we've adopted. I agree with my colleague on this topic, though. Most, uh, most other states do not have the history uh, of, of doing what we've done out here. And so uh, that will be opportunity for contention there. And as was just observed, they don't have the statutory authority to begin counting votes until election day. And so that's a problem. Uh, and so then there's issues even with certain secretary of state's office as to uh, or, or election offices around the country as to when those ballots must be in in order to be counted. Uh, so there's differing rules. And as we know, where there's differing rules, that creates contention. Um, and the, given the tension of the electorate right now, I don't want to predict this. I don't want to see it. But people have asked, is, do you expect some type of violence? And I, I would say, yeah, given the tension of the electorate right now and what's gone on. I'm hoping that we have clear results. As we said, if, if you have some states that are traditionally red states, with with mar with less with three to five point margins for for Biden or for the president, that would be a less uh, that would be a less contentious outcome. But um, and that may happen. I mean that that may happen as well, given the uh, given the state of affairs here uh, in the country. Because um, I like to point this out to people. Um, remember that absent the pandemic and absent the subsequent economic collapse. 
the president gets reelected. Uh, if, if we can reverse the clock to February, and we should all keep that in mind, that um, the, uh, the, the pandemic, the response to the pandemic and the subsequent economic collapse has created and exposed a vulnerability in the administration that otherwise wouldn't have been here. Um, and so even with the social, I believe even with the social justice issues, because I think those were heightened as in the lockdown in, in those periods. So, uh, you know, it, it's a tension filled place. Uh, I'm going to say my prayers on election day that it goes well and that that we have uh, that we have clarity on election night. But I don't expect that right now. But I don't I didn't expect 2020 either. So I don't think any of us did. So, Charles, Chuck, you just answered a question um, that Hartman Fiedler had from Austrian Public Radio. But let me ask Ellie this, too, because, I mean, you, you seem clear that if, if it not for the pandemic, Trump would have sort of um, sailed or glided to a reelection. Ellie, do you think that too, from the Wisconsin perspective, or even just your, you know, your um, expertise um, in uh, American politics, was this sort of the breaking thing for President Trump, the break point? Again, I don't. We don't know what's going to happen yet, but <laughs> I mean, most presidents, most of the time, win re-election, especially if there's a good economy. And so, if you look back to what things were like in January, we had a president up for re-election with a good economy, knowing nothing else. I would have said his chances were pretty good. Maybe it wouldn't have been a landslide. Maybe it would have been a close election as 2016 was. But I think, you know, I probably would have put money down that way if, if someone had asked me then. But, you know, so many things have played out. And it's not just the events that have played out, but it's also been the administration's response to those events. And I think those things are sort of interacting now here where, you know, people are looking to see sort of, you know, what has the administration done or not done? What are the consequences of that then? The two candidates have really different visions about how to respond to this pandemic. And so I think, you know, people are sort of responding to that. It's not clear to me that if the president hadn't taken different steps, taken a more empathetic tone, sort of just taken a different approach to this, that we wouldn't have seen a sort of rally around the president and national moment of crisis type response like we saw after 9-11. Maybe we would still be in the same place with the economic collapse, but I'm not even sure that that's True, I think it's the combination of these circumstances and how the administrations responded to them that have created the sort of pretty extreme outcome that you know we shouldn't be seeing given that we have a president up for re-election where we had a good economy, you know, a year ago. So both of you at the beginning of our discussion talked about how you know unique your states are in terms of voting demographics and just sort of you know where the country where the state sits in the country and what the issues are you know what issues are important but are there any local issues that um, are also going to bring voters to the polls because Rob is asking Rob from Arizona um, are there any local issues on the ballot that are motivating voters to also go out and vote or is this completely based on you know, the pandemic and its management and the president's, um, you know, management of the pandemic, as well as the state of the economy. Who first? <laughs> okay. Was this a stump, <laughs> stumper at the end? <laughs> no. No local issues? No, I can go. I, I'll take a shot <laughs> first. You know, immigration uh, has always been a very significant issue within the ele uh, electorate uh, in Arizona. And it's been understood broadly because of the security response had in 10 and how that has evolved into an economic response now. It, uh, as I said earlier, Mexico is uh, Arizona's largest trading partner. Uh, on the ballot though this fall, there are two significant ballot issues uh, on the ballot, on the statewide ballot. One is a significant progressive plan to increase income taxes in Arizona um, by 40% on the upper income bracket. So, 250 for uh, uh, single filers and 500,000 for joint filers um, to increase uh, income taxes to pay for public education. So um, that is significantly drawn a lot of criticism from, uh, from what otherwise should have been an uncontentious issue because there's, there's overwhelming majorities of public opinion that believe we, do, we need to do a better job of funding public education in Arizona. But as we said, you know, this is a, this is a, that's a purple, that's a blue proposal in what otherwise would be a purple state. Uh, the other one is a, we're going to be joining uh, the other Western United States uh, country, uh, states in legalizing marijuana this fall. Um, I, we fully, I fully expect that to pass as well. 
it's not such a driver of an issue. The education issue is a significant issue on the ballot out here. But, you know, overall, it, it, the 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 elephant in the room is the presidential election and the and and the and the nature of the country's behavior right now. Ellie, what do you think? Yeah, we don't have any um, statewide uh, elections other than the, the presidency. We don't have any statewide sort of referenda that are happening. But I would say that sort of two local issues that are motivating different types of voters here. You know, on the more rural side, Wisconsin is America's dairy land, as we so proudly like to proclaim. We produce a lot of cheese and milk and all of those things. And those farmers have been really decimated the last several years by the president, by President Trump's trade wars. You know, they, those voters typically are, you know, pre, you know, in 2016 were strong backers of the president. Many of them still are, but I think his support has sort of softened among some of, some of those voters. So we see that on the Republican side. You know, on the Democratic side, uh, Wisconsin, or I should say 2020 is a, a census year. We count the entire population and then there would be redistricting for all the districts in 2020, 2022. Wisconsin has the, in terms of our state legislature, has the most gerrymandered districts in the country. So that in 2018, Democrats won almost 60% of the votes in the state legislature, but still lost the majority because the districts are so gerrymandered. So. There's a big motivation among Democratic voters to sort of try to move the needle a little further on the state legislature with the hope of getting sort of what they would call fair maps, fair districts, to, so that the balance of seats in the legislature more accurately represents the vote share uh, in the elections. And so that's a big contentious issue uh, on the Democratic side, just the way sort of trade and farming and sort of agriculture is on the Republican side here. Hey, let, let me echo an issue there as well on uh, on that. That that is absolutely true in Arizona as well. Um, we both both chambers of the Arizona legislature are in play, and we've seen a significant increase in Democratic spending as well in order to begin to change those two bodies. And I expect one of them to go in the House of Representatives out here, which has not happened uh, since the '60s. So again, that's another sign that uh, uh, things are changing. It's not, we're not in Arizona anymore. It's a different type of Arizona. Well, on, on that note, we're at the end here, but I'll ask one last question and you can answer it briefly. Um, things are changing. Um, your states, I don't think, have been known to be sort of swing states in the past. What's the long-term trajectory for Wisconsin and Arizona? Will they remain um, sort of volatile in terms of being purple states and can go either way? Or is this a one-time thing right now? Uh, I'll take a shot. Um, you know, I, I talked to a former chairman of the Democratic Party out here recently. Uh, as we've just observed, they have not been in control of much in the state of Arizona for a while. So you know, I believe if they're handed the ball, um, as most as we've just observed, referendums become referendums on what that party does. And given my earlier uh, discussion, I don't think Arizona is a is is a Pelosi Schumer uh, hue of. Uh, so I think it's really interesting to watch how that will evolve, how, how Democrats governing narrative will evolve. You know, is it is it a very progressive uh, narrative? Because I don't think that'll last out here. Um, and so, how how do those parts of the party in Arizona begin to narrate how they govern? And what do Republicans do that allows those uh, Trump Republicans to stay in the fold, but also re-narrate what it means to be a Republican? Um, and, and what does that look like? Um, and you know that that to me that's really exciting. Uh, I won't get into what I think about that, but uh, it is going to be a, a significant opportunity for both parties uh, and new leadership in both parties to begin to broach those topics. Ellie, and what about Wisconsin? Um, will it be, remain a swing state long term? I think in, the, in the, the short to medium term, at least, I think we're likely to remain a swing state. Wisconsin's been sort of, we all, we, while we've had periods of you know, Republican control at the state government level you know, for several years, I think we've seen this back and forth of control of the governorship. We've seen back and forth voting for liberal and conservative senators. 
you know, we within the state, we've seen a lot of population growth towards the cities and more urban areas of the state and away from the more rural areas, which on the one hand could help Democrats, but you know, long term, you know, the state is is just very white. It's very rural overall outside these uh, urban areas, which are just strong, you know, bastions of Republican support. And so I think, you know, at least for the 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 short to medium term, I think you know, swing state is probably Wisconsin's future. Well, thanks to both of you. It was really interesting just going, you know, deep into what's going on in Arizona and in Wisconsin. Um, thanks to all of you that have tuned in and look forward to seeing you for our next election event. Enjoy the rest of your morning or afternoon, wherever you are for Chuck, your morning for sure. <laughs> okay, thank you. Get my second cup of coffee here in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Thank you.